welcome to the Garden Organic Podcast. I'm Sarah Brown, Garden Organic's Growing Advice Editor, and I'm joined by Chris Collins, our Head of Horticulture. For the next 40 minutes, we'll be talking about organic growing, giving you tips and advice. But before we start, Chris and I wanted to say how much we're enjoying making these podcasts. We're on to number three now, and we're thrilled by positive comments and the number of listeners. Thousands of lovely organic growers have tuned in from all around the world, and the numbers keep growing. So thanks for listening and supporting our organic conversations. This month, we're discussing the organic way with weeds, how to avoid those nasty, toxic chemical weed killers, and what to do with the weeds when you pull them up. Chris tells us how to prepare the soil for sowing outside, and we both have thoughts on the no-dig technique. We also explore the world of online ordering when I get into conversation with one of the biggest plant and seed suppliers who are working towards going organic. I was fascinated to hear about the issues of scale, what happens when things go wrong, and how do you find the perfect tasting tomato? Okay, Chris, it's May. It is, mate, one of my favourite months of the year, Yeah, me too, me too. (laughs) Don't you find April, though it's lovely and spring's beginning, it's a little bit nerve-wracking. You think, is there going to be a frost tonight? Is there going to be hailstorms? I feel May, I'm hard at work, but I can relax into it. I think you know that, yeah, you've jumped that sort of fence of you're into the gardening season. I don't think you're ever quite there with April. You're always on the edge of knowing that the winter will give a last kick. It will give a last kick, and so you're not ready to go full tilt, are you really? I kind of liken it to, a, you're sitting in a very flash car, say a Porsche at the traffic lights, but the lights are still red in April. When May comes, week or so in the May, the light goes green and you know you can really crack on. Yeah, yeah, because everything that was inside, your sewing and your greenhouse and everything you were protecting, you can now begin to think about putting yeah. outside. And you, I know, have got a lot of seedlings <laughs> well, waiting to go I hope out. May needs to come, otherwise I will be divorced, I think, because, <laughs> <laughs> well, my desk at the moment is, uh, in my office, is just broad beans and runner beans and uh, and French beans and courgettes and it's all just sitting there waiting to go and so I'm in pole position but exactly as you described Sarah. Chris let's talk practical how are you preparing the soil to get those seedlings out? Well I've done quite a lot over the year over the um, winter sorry so now I've just literally started drill sowing all my stuff like carrots. Drill sowing um, you mean by that yeah. sowing in so, the So what I'll do is I have dug over my, my soil it's had compost that's pretty much broken down, to be honest with you. I have good soil. I'm on an allotment, which was used for 100 years, so the soil's nice condition. Um, I've literally I've dug it too hard. I've forked it, I would say. So quite light. I've then trod it. I've consolidated it, which means I've taken all the air pockets out. I've had the rake on it. So I've got a lovely sort. I call it the apple crumble tilth, that lovely fine tilth. And then what I'll do is I put a piece of bamboo one end, one part side of the um, bed and one side of the other. I put a string down, and then I knock a little trench out along that string, and I sow my carrots into that, my lettuce into that, my rocket into that. So my um, allotment has two sort of nice big raised beds. Is now a series of pieces of string that have had the seed sown into them, basically. And obviously that means that I know when they start to emerge, anything on that string is the plant I want to keep, as opposed I'm to the weeds. I'm interested to say, I'm interested to hear you say that you trod on the soil, because it's yeah. one of the golden rules I always thought, that you don't tread on your soil because you compact it. Well, I wouldn't do it if it was wet, put it that way. It's a dry condition, but I'd always consolidate. It's no different from sowing seed into a tray. You get a tamper which is like a piece of wood, and you consolidate. You take out the air pockets. If you've got air pockets in there and it's undulating, you won't get even germination, so I'd always consolidate. Um, and, that, and that means I've got... Then I'll run the rake over it. I mean, I've got a nice billiard table of soft, soft crumbly saw ready to sew into you. Yeah. But when I do consolidate, this is important to say, I don't just tread on over it any old way, back of my heels, tight to get the back of my heels, and I tread along very tight, keep a nice tight line my feet together so I'm consolidating so the weight is distributed quite evenly. Okay, thank you and very practical. And then of course that's for sowing but when you're planting out your seedlings, these things that are all over your desk and your balcony Mm. and your greenhouse, obviously you've got to be prepared to protect them. Yes, I've got, it's true, I've got, I'm all my... Well, we, as you know, slugs and snakes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Pigeons. Well, exactly, well, pigeons, well, we'll start with pigeons, because they're my biggest nemesis, I think. They probably would be for you, even though you're out in the countryside. You have well, to it's a funny thing that I do have pigeons, of course I do, living out in the countryside, but I have a pair of pigeons nesting yeah. in the oak tree just above my garden, and it's an old rule of thumb, if you can encourage a pair to nest, very often yeah. they don't 
destroy as much as if you're if you don't because yeah. i think what they're doing is they're protecting their territory right so yes they may come down and feed but i don't get a whole flock i don't get a whole load of pigeons yeah. coming down and feeding <laughs> so you reckon so two is all right then because all pigeons all birds and all wildlife's there for a reason yeah obviously i've had big nightmares with them again obviously i live in london there's a lot of pigeon and um but I have to net, so particularly brassicas. Remember last year I grew pak choy, which is one of my favourites. I love a bit of soy sauce. I love pak choy. And I couldn't grow any because the pigeons, as soon as they got a certain height, pigeons were at it. Mm-hmm. And it all came to the point where I was actually using the pak choy to companion plant to keep it off the brassicas. But now I've got, I've got a big sort of see-through net. I put that over. I, I put it in with bamboo and I cover and I pin that down with 10 pegs. And that solves my problem with brassicas, to be honest. Yes, I agree. And I use netting to keep off the butterflies. Yeah, and the white, the cabbage white. Yeah, the yeah. cabbage white. Once well, they it gets will, on they and will, lays yeah, its, its yeah. caterpillars. And that, that netting will keep them out. That yeah. will keep them out as well. So I'm doing two jobs. And it's, and it's porous so you can water through it as well. So it really does work. So you're putting the netting down right from the get-go. Right when from you the put off. that first seedling, that first yeah. plant in, small plant. It still so, needs protecting. It does. So I've got brassicas, cauliflower, this kind of stuff, kale um, in propagators at the moment, small seedlings. I've already put the net up. So I'll grow them on and I will plant them under that net. So I'll put the net in first and then I'll plant. And that means I'll, I'll get very less, little damage. I think the thing we have to be careful with netting is keep it firm and keep yeah. it netted down firmly because if a bird gets under and yeah. gets trapped, yeah. and even worse, hedgehogs, any small mammals like that... Will cause problems. So the answer is they're about three quid for 50 get some tent pegs that is absolutely oh, perfect ordinary so, so, yeah i'll get them to i'll get them online and, and i just temp peg everything down in it okay thank you chris very practical um weeding and of course this time of year may the weeds are out in strength just as our own plants are so chris how do you keep on top of your weeding well in circumstances on my allotment which is a very weedy place if I allowed it to be because it was completely overgrown when I took it over and I mean over overgrown really properly um, and I've just sowed a lot of uh, quick crops in there lettuce cut a can salad rocket I put my carrots my turnips in and I tend to sow very much in drills okay so very much I need to keep them straight lines and then I need to get in between with a hoe that's kind of how I do it I don't really want to be walking on that ground once I've sown I like to be no dig it so I want to be able to identify the plants I'm growing and knock out the ones that don't and it's very important that I get in early because if I let those weeds start to seed and, and then, it, you know, flower and seed, mm. then I'm going to have a bigger problem the rest of the summer. So very much when I water, I then check to see if stuff's coming up. And you're sowing, you're growing quite densely as well, aren't you? So I, I pack, in, yeah. So that doesn't allow the weeds to take, there isn't a lot of room for the weeds. No, a good gardener, whether I was doing it amenity or edible, I don't want to see soil. I want to see plant. And that then uh, perpetuates the fact that the watering's less because it's not transpiring out the soil so much. It's blocking out the, the weeds because there's no light coming in. I personally don't want to see soil. And I'd be interested to see what the listeners think about that. But I, I want to get those plants up growing. I sow quite thick. When I plant, I plant quite thick because I want the ornamentals or the edibles to take over that piece of land. But in this month in particular, you've still got some yeah. bare soil yeah. because yeah. your own Of course, nothing's there at the moment. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. So you're hand weeding, I assume. I'm hand weeding. So I have two two things going on. So if you can imagine, I, I on my drills, which is my sewing trench where I put the straight tree. lines yeah my straight line I put bamboo bamboo and a bit of string along that I do that for two reasons one I can get the hoe in between so I know I'm not hoeing out my crop especially when it's young and the other way you'll see I have horsetail on my allotment I can see the horsetail coming up in the lines on that string and then I have to get in with my fingers and do that so I'll put a plank down so I'm not treading on the soil and I'll go along and I'll individually pull out anything there. And you'll find in another month when my plants are six, seven, eight, ten centimetres that problem reduces quite heavily yeah I think most people, when they use the toxic weed killers containing glyphosate, which we know is bad for you, we know it's incontrovertible now that it's going to cause problems, I think that's usually used on hard surfaces. And that's understandable. These are paths and patios that you've laid and you want to look immaculate. But, of course, you don't need to use a chemical on it. Use a knife, use a trowel, have that quiet moment weeding it out and maybe enjoy it maybe listening to a podcast yes exactly i think that weeding to me is an integral part of being a gardener i think that it's part of my whole psyche of being a gardener when i'm out there if i'm weeding around plants that i'm deliberately trying to grow while i'm doing that i'm then looking at the health of the plant a bit like our analogy on watering when you water look how your plant doing when you're weeding you look how your plant's doing so i think to take it out of the equation is wrong i think you can't do it that way as far as patios and plants going i think boiling hot kettle of water after you've made a cup of tea will we'll check weeds anyway in a patio or 
why not repoint? If your if your patio is full of, of of holes and weeds are coming through, repoint. Or if you want to be really ambitious, why not try and plant a little bit of hybridia or campanula in there and let them do the growing instead. And then that looks beautiful. Yeah, that looks really nice. Have you tried one of those hand flame burners? I have. <laughs> I nearly set light to my raised bed, to be honest with you. <laughs> they're great for weeds when they're small or small weeds. They're great if you've got a larger weeds, hand weed, I would say, or, or boiling water again, because um, I have a lot of cooch grass and it comes up on either side of my raised beds I've quite shallow raised beds and I nearly set light to the whole thing once and uh, and it doesn't really it's not it doesn't it doesn't just go poof and it's gone it kind of it's quite a slow process for a bigger plant so I would pull out that by hand and when it starts to show its tips again then maybe use the burner yes and I use the burner I tried to use the burner on my large terrace which is gravel covered <laughs> it took forever to yeah. cover the you area. go through can and can and can Absolutely. and gas yeah, yeah. but you're quite right yeah. I think they're useful for spot weeding I like the way you tie in weeding with observation and being in touch with what's growing and how it's growing I think also from an organic point of view it's important to decide which weeds you want to keep not yes, the ones you yeah, want to get rid yeah. of, the ones you want to keep, because we know how important they are. I love dandelions, I love taxarum, I love that plant, I love thistles, I love these plants, they're very beneficial, they'll bring in insects and, and, and stuff you want in the garden anyway. Well the dandelion yeah. in particular, that bright yellow yeah. head. But bee pollen for bees is incredible. Exactly, yeah. these are insects that have just come out of hibernation, mm. they desperately need them. Yeah. So I think then, why not look at it this way, is you have an area for them to be, to thrive. So what I've done in my allotment is I will use a corridor. So you have 20 centimetres along the edge of the, of, the, of the allotment and it's theirs. Please be a dandelion, please be a thistle, be that and get on with it. And I'll, if, it, if stuff's seeded into my allotment a little bit, I'll take that pain because I just think you need those plants there and you'll get your ladybirds and your hoverflies and your bumblebees and they'll all be there. Yeah. And also their foliage can be very useful on the compost heap. Yes. Yeah, so dandelions yeah. we know are full of potassium, their leaves are full of potassium. We know that stinging nettles, their leaves create a wonderful nitrate solution if you yep. put them in water. So don't ignore your weeds. They have great uses. I think they they are your ally, not your enemy. I Absolutely. think, yeah, I, th I really believe that. And um, it's quite interesting. When I started, we started in gardening all those years ago, they were never viewed that way. They were something to attack and eradicate. Yeah. And they my were attitude, Yeah, they were. And, and not only a lot of them native, so they belong here, just like we do. I think our, our, our attitude to them has completely changed. And, I, and one of the reasons I'm so like being an organic gardener is I've embraced these plants and I'm really, I feel better. I feel a better gardener for it. So from weeds, we now move to buying seeds and plants. We thought it would be interesting to give you a taste of what is involved in managing a large gardening sales business. At a trade event earlier this year, I met with Dobies, who work with Garden Organic on producing the organic gardening catalogue. I wanted to hear how important organic is to them and how they're managing to integrate it into a business in a very competitive world. I spoke to their product development manager, Rob Smith, to talk about the joys and challenges of his job. But first, we hear from David Robinson, Dobies' chief executive. Because he owns the business, he's personally committed to its organic journey. David, without wanting to dish the dirt on your competitors, do you feel that you're at cutting edge, you're at the leaders in this particular area? Uh, I, I would think we are, yes. I mean, our nursery up in Yorkshire, where we grow a lot of our plug plants, um, we grow those in certified organic manners. Uh, our nursery down in Paynton, where we started growing plants uh, three years ago, we grew 20,000 plants. Last year, we grew over half a million. We're growing those according to organic principles as well and um, I think we're the only company like us that is doing that and I think it worked for Garden Organic and for us where you're wanting to work with people on a journey towards becoming more organic and we were on that journey yes. I think I think that was that that was what we felt was yes. the reason for us working together which is a yeah. true partnership but from your own personal beliefs which I know you're a strong environmentalist yourself and you have a small holding down in Devon and I, small holding is going a bit far we have a field <laughs> and, and, and we have a garden with a polytunnel and have some beehives but, but I think you're very not, keen on yeah. wildlife and you're very keen I on the careful management of that land yeah. tell me some other things that you do as a business that fulfill these ethics these concerns yes well i mean there's um, there was a lot of wastage in the seeds what used to happen it was the model within the industry is that you'd send the seeds out to the garden centers they'd sell what they could through the year and then in the june of the following year you'd take all of those seeds back scrap the ones that hadn't sold and produce new seeds and send them out new packs. Oh, 
really? And I found that horrific. So we changed the model and now we only take back the ones which price is changing or they're not going to be viable because they have a short uh, viability period. So it saves over a million packs of wasted seeds a year that oh, otherwise okay. would go into landfill. So uh, And plastic? Are you managing to reduce the amount of plastic that you use in the pot? Yes, we are. Like so for example, we started sending the catalogues out without a, a plastic wrapper where, wherever possible. The pots, um, we've got the, a thinner plastic and we've just now changed it from black plastic which can't be recycled into a green plastic that plastic that we are using so that's an interesting challenge um, is there anything you can share with us in where you see trends going or where you see Sutton's Mm. and Dobies going we bought a, a business last year a beekeeping business and that is dear to my heart it's got me into beekeeping apart from anything else Uh, We've seen a trend there, much greater interest in insects. There's been so much news about decline of insect populations and people are now closely linking that to loss of habitat but also to how the plants are grown and and whether there are pesticides used on the plants as well. Again, we could not be spraying our plants with neonicotinoids if we've then got a beekeeping business. So the whole thing fits together. And so last year we've launched a stand of seeds for pollinators and predators. So growing plants that will encourage lacewings, uh, ladybirds, hoverflies. Hoverflies, yes. Exactly. All these beneficial insects that do so much yes. good in the garden. Which is just an indication there is a trend there that generally out there people are becoming more aware of what's happening in the environment and the risks of it to all of us. I'm getting passionate yeah. now. So. <laughs> like a true organic grower. Yeah. Yes, it, it, it is. But I think what's so nice about Garden Organic is that you're, you're not preaching to people. And I think all you can do is try and do things the right way and let people know how they can do the little bit more to just improve themselves. And that, I think that works for us as a business. It's been very nice talking to you. And Thank you, you, David. Thanks for that. I'm now with Rob Smith, who's Product Development Manager. And Rob, you have the fun job, and it really does sound like a fun job, of bringing new plants, new seeds, new varieties into the market. Yeah, it basically means that um, over the years I go on trials throughout Europe and throughout the world, uh, looking for new and interesting, mainly edibles on my side. I work closely with breeders who will um, help us develop or breed certain products that we want or try and breed resistance into certain crops which are notoriously difficult to grow. So anything that makes it easier for a gardener to grow I think is of benefit because you don't want to spend months growing something that's ruined the day before you want to eat it just because it's got botrytis or just because it has uh, mildew or something like that. So the less input you need to put into the plant and fiddle with the plant, the easier it is to grow and especially organically. If there's inbuilt resistance and things are not a problem to grow, that means people aren't tempted to spray because there's no problem to spray. And are you led by fashion or taste? Personally, for me, I would like to say it's taste uh, because I believe there's no point in growing something that I don't want to eat or I don't enjoy eating. I don't care if it's the wonkiest parsnip in the world, but if it tastes fantastic, I will grow it again and again. If it's the perfect red tomato that's insipid, watery and has no flavour, why would you want to grow that? You can buy that in the supermarket and people do and they're horrible and we know they are. So to grow at home, I think it's all about taste. So Rob, I can imagine us gardeners have a few, well, I know we have a few problems with weather and conditions. This must be doubly worse if you're growing on a commercial scale. (laughs) Tell us, have you had some disasters? It can be a challenge, shall we put it that way? Um, So obviously, since we've become more involved with Garden Organic, our nursery and our trials ground now are as organic as we can get. Six tomato plants might cost you a couple of pounds. Using a couple of million of them can cost you an absolute fortune. Uh, so we took some we took some really good advice from uh, the guys at Garden Organic, and we use a lot of things like uh, listeners may be familiar with companion planting, how you use one plant to benefit another. Off we use what's called almost like one step further, which is called indicator planting. So we will use plants that are very very susceptible to pests. Um, but we will intersperse them throughout our glass houses, throughout our polytunnels. They get checked twice a day. If there are any pests in that glass house, that plant will be the first one to show it because it's the pest's favourite thing. So the pests will go to that indicator plant. If we see a problem on that, we know we've got to be able to do something to the crop. 
What are the indicator plants that you use? We uh, we use Nicotiana, like the tobacco plant. We've used uh, poached egg plants, like for different methods. For different plants, there are different things. We will even use almost like sacrificial planting. So we would put some aubergine plants in with tomatoes because they will show pests and problems before the tomato plant will. So then we use a lot of predatory mites. We use a lot of biological controls now and nematodes. But when it comes to things that aren't biological, like the weather, we're we're in exactly the same boat as the home gardener. Except it's a million tomatoes rather than just half a dozen. We yeah, last year we had uh, one of our uh, big big polytunnels. You know the weather we had last year; the snow was unbelievable. But this was down in Devon, and Devon doesn't get snow. Devon just gets wet. It just rains in Devon. <laughs> So we turned up to uh, work one Monday morning and it was very, very early, it was about half past six, um, polytunnel and it collapsed, crushing everything inside. So it had gone from the middle inwards, almost like a dagger, like a V-shape, yeah. gone in the middle. And I can't remember what the crop was, but they weren't hardy and there was snow everywhere. It was freezing cold, it was, mm. it was, it was windy. And I think it was just over a quarter of a million plants. And most of them were sold. Oh, so you when, when you say they were sold, they'd already been sold. They'd you'd been had sold. the customer's money. We'd had the customer's money. But they'd been destroyed by the yeah, snow. Yeah, we'd had the customer's money. And then we're literally just finishing off growing them to send them out at the perfect time. So how do you tell a quarter of a million customers... <laughs> this is a disaster. ...that they've all died? Luckily, they hadn't. We had got quite a few that um, grown in another location, same site, but another, another tunnel, which we had enough to cover because we've always got extra. It brings me on to something else, Rob, which I'm quite interested in. You're growing for perfection. You have to because you say your customers have spent good money. Yeah. But that must, at times, there must be a tension between that and also seeing a plant that's not quite perfect but you know it's just as good and it would do just as well we tr- we try and grow over our allocation so we will if if we think we need a thousand plants we will grow 1200 what we try to do is we try to get the best varieties so I think on the genetic side we always go for the things that will say grow and germinate together at home when you grow a packet of seeds you don't mind if your tomato seeds come up within 7 to 14 days for a commercial grower that is absolutely no good whatsoever because then you have tomatoes at every single stage of growth when those tomatoes that we select to be grown as plants come up they have to germinate within 48 hours of each other or they get thrown away how do you control that a lot of it can be done with the actual seed and the variety so What a lot of your listeners may not know is there are different grades of seed. So there are seeds that are available for seed packets and then there is plant grade seed which is a lot more expensive because the germination is nigh on as good as it can be. So the the germination of a seed packet cabbage may be 80%. If we want that same cabbage to be grown as a plant we need seed that's got 90, 95, 98% germination and they will all grow at the same time. The the science behind it is absolutely mesmerising, but that's just to get you a perfect cabbage. One other thing is, what are you growing them in? Presumably you're doing research into the growing medium that you're using, which we trust is peat-free? This year in retail, we've got 100% peat-free. So You must be one of the first to do that, aren't you? I think we are. We've we've managed to um, go down that route with our vegetables this year, that have been grown in Yorkshire. Instead of using peat, it's got wood pulp, wood chip, it's got coir uh, and other bits and bobs to make it as unrecognisable as peat-free as possible. The plants you've actually seen today, they're all in peat-free compost. Now, you wouldn't know that was peat-free. Plants are healthy, the compost looks the same, smells the same, I was going to say tastes the same, but I don't (laughs) normally eat it. Um, But you wouldn't be able to tell the difference and that was the aim of the trials to go peat-free you should be able to walk into a nursery and someone should be able to say to you, you tell me which one of those plants has been grown in peat-free. So for Garden Organic listeners, it's well worth searching this out. And if you can't find plants growing in peat-free medium, now you know where to go. Exactly. Brilliant, Rob. And you're particularly interested in heritage varieties, is that right? I love, yeah, I love them. <laughs> I, no, I get really excited about their, their heritage varieties. And it all comes down to my granddad. Um, so when I was a little boy, my mum and dad both worked, so we used to go to my grandparents, and my granddad used to have a big council house with a huge garden, the old Anderson shelter, um, and he used to have a little old greenhouse with a brick base, almost an allotment, but in his back garden. 
and I used to go into his shed. I was tiny and he was big and he'd be reaching up and there'd be these brown paper bags everywhere. And he'd go, what's that? And I'm like, it looks like a bag of dirt or it looks like stone. And then he'd give me a cabbage and he'd go, that's what that is. Trying to teach me those seeds are what these things are. Yeah. And they were all things he'd saved himself. They're in little paper bags of everything. Because so, people saved their own seeds because, in those days. Exactly, because people saved their own seeds and that's what he'd always done. And that's what his granddad had done and that's what his dad had done. So back then there weren't the F1s. There weren't all, all these. Yes, they're, they're good because it makes it easier. But back F1s, then there was no other just, choice. Just remind me, F1s are specially bred, aren't they? Yeah, so F1 varieties of uh, vegetables are hybrid vegetables. So we're not talking Frankenstein food, GM, anything like that. They're just simply put, they are two varieties that are cross-pollinated to create a, a baby, basically, if we think of it in human forms, but with the characteristics they want. So you might have a fantastic tasting tomato with a terrible shelf life and a terrible tasting tomato with a brilliant shelf life. So they cross them both to get a fantastic tomato with a good shelf life. And the heritage veg that you saw your grandfather sowing was that he got from his father and his grandfather. Yeah. He knew they would have a good taste or he knew they would survive well in his particular garden and his particular it's, growing conditions. Exactly, because when, when you look um, at what Garden Organic do and some of the old heritage varieties, you will have things called, say, uh, it's not a real name, but Northumberland Wonder because it's been grown in Northumberland since anyone can remember, and it loves that temperature, it loves that microclimate, but if you take it somewhere else, it may not do as well. So to a big seed company, yeah, that's a lovely story, it's not commercial because it won't grow anywhere. So by taking Northumberland Wonder and crossing it with Sheffield Beauty or something like that, they create one with the benefits of both that will grow anywhere. But the heritage ones, they've got the taste people like, I think there's an affection as well for them, isn't there? It's yeah. something that you, you've explained, it's to do with history and it's to do with your own personal history. I understand you're also doing it through Dobies. You're actually yeah. now trying to bulk up some seeds from the Heritage Seed Library. At Sutton's and at Dobies, because Dobies have a, quite a large trial ground with lots and lots of polytunnels and lots of glass space in Devon, I was able to uh, persuade, shall we say, the owners to let me have a little bit of that space and last year, instead of it being a normal seed guardian who could send back a couple of hundred seeds, we sent back 80,000 seeds oh, wow. of one variety. And that space could have been used for commercial purposes and it could have made money. But we're not in it just for the money. We, like Sutton's and Dobie's wouldn't have partnered with Garden Organic and they wouldn't have partnered with the, the Organic Gardening Catalogue if it was purely about profit. It's about saving the genetic diversity, saving these old varieties, Letting people experience the taste that our families and our ancestors were brought up on. That's interesting you mentioned taste in particular because of course taste is the thing that's leading you because you're sourcing varieties for their taste. Yeah. How do you test for taste? Is there a process? Is it like wine tasting? Are you the wine taster of the tomato <laughs> world? <laughs> I wish. Um, I think, to be honest, when it comes to tastings, um, it can be very subjective because it can be very personal. So if we take tomatoes for an example, I like quite a tart tomato, quite acidic. Some people just like sweet. So how we try to work now that I've become involved is I will grow these things, I will keep my opinions to myself and I literally go around the office and there are certain times of the year people don't bring their lunch in because they know they're going to be filled up with different tomatoes. I've got a little tick box. What do you like? Does it have a good taste? Long lasting taste? All these different criterias and we even went one step further last year by going to Exeter University and they did independent taste tests for us. They had the students do the blind tasting, like we would do in the office to see what we like, but they also do it scientifically. So they were doing tests for different volatile chemicals on the tomatoes. Most people think that if it's a tomato, people like sweet. Sweet didn't win. Sweet was important, but people liked a depth of flavour, whereas one-dimensional is very, that's nice, and it's gone, the flavour's gone. So people liked an initial burst of flavour, they liked the flavour to change, but they liked the flavour to linger. So it was very interesting that the most popular tomatoes sales-wise was not the most popular when it came to the taste test. Rob, that's very interesting. And I 
I still hold by it. You are the wine taster of tomatoes. <laughs> <laughs> Rob, I know you've had an interesting life. It hasn't always <laughs> been a, a, centered around growing and certainly not around tasting tomatoes. You originally worked as a flight attendant, isn't that right? I did, yeah. Well, um, so I, jo- I joined Virgin Atlantic back in, oh crikey, last century now. So it was 90, I think it was 97, 98. But the big change was when you entered the big allotment challenge on yeah. BBC. Yeah, yeah the, I, I, was on, I was on Twitter um, and an advert came up as sometimes they do and at the time uh, the first series hadn't been launched it hadn't been released to the press and no one, no one who was out of the TV world knew about it and it said if you're interested in growing your own you make produce from it and you grow flowers or do flower arranging would you complete this form and we'll get back to you so I thought well I've got two allotments of course I grow my own well if you grow your own why would you not cook it what do you do with it if you don't cook it so obviously that's a no brainer and if they will tenuously accept daffodils in a jam jar on a kitchen table, yes, I do flower arranging. So I did. Um, and they said, oh, yeah, we're really interested. It's for a TV programme. And that's suddenly when reality hits and you think, oh, uh, you, you need to tell me more about this because obviously I'm going to LA tomorrow. What, what, what are How we I doing? And yeah, and then I'm in Sydney the week after. Yeah. So what the <laughs> heck is going to happen there? And they said, well, come down to London for an interview and we'll have a chit chat and uh, we'll tell you more then there was a horticultural expert there who would ask questions because obviously there are some types of people that will just say they can do anything or do anything to get on tv so they had to make sure you knew what you were talking about and i always remember um the lady's name was louise the horticultural expert and she said to me so broad beans what's going to be your main problem with broad beans and i just remember turning around to her and saying well apart from the black fly i can't really think of anything and she went that'll do so it was like we are now having a chat it was lovely. It wasn't like an interview or anything. It was very, very nice. They asked me to take some produce down that I'd made. So I took some chutneys and jams down. They tasted those. They liked them. And then it got to the flower arranging bit. Loads of different types of flowers. And they went, pull the stopwatch out. Right, you got five minutes to make us something. Oh, and well, suddenly, that's not a daffodil in a jam jar. No, it's not. <laughs> no. But a guy came in with a camera. And the camera was in your face. And they started asking questions. And I'm like, oh, I'm trying to do this. I can't talk to you. They went, no, no, no. You've got to do and talk, because if you're going to be on TV, you have to be able to talk about what you're doing without looking at it. But I just thought, oh, that's it. No, oh, that's scuppered your chances here, Rob. So apparently 5,000 people applied. They interviewed, I think it was a couple of hundred. So I got on the train to go home. I've been on the train 15 minutes, and they went, we want you on the show. Did it, they give you an allotment to grow on there? Yeah, it's, a, it's the most beautiful, old, walled garden that they'd split into nine different allotments it was really hard work and over a period of months six months over six months six so you months. were doing the allotment challenge plus all your flight attending around the world yeah it must have been tough and trying to do two allotments at home and then what you haven't said is that you then won it yes i did i know yeah <laughs> But yeah, that was um, that was a shock as well. So yeah, it was it was absolutely amazing. And was that the moment, the light bulb moment, when you thought, do you know, I think I might give up the flying? I actually thought, yeah, you know what? I love growing. I've had my allotments for years. I've been growing since I could walk. How can I now make this a living? If I can make a job and a living out of what I love doing, you're the luckiest man on earth. Rob, just let's look at the future now. Can you predict to us, to the listeners, what will be big, say, in the in the years to come? We've we've got plans probably. So we're in two thousand nineteen now. We're working on what the furthest away is probably twenty twenty four at the moment with breeding in the edible side, which is crazy because it takes so long, and you can be right at the end and things fail. Uh, when it comes to where you say the trends and things like that. I think the the main thing that we've noticed is that, like listeners will notice, houses and new houses have smaller gardens. There's less and less land for us. We don't all have, like my granddad had the old council house with a huge garden. Now, there isn't the room for ornamentals and edibles, and there's a real big increase in the dual purpose things. The things that look beautiful but are edible. Like the purple cabbage. Or like, yeah, like the purple cabbage or like even blueberries. So normal blueberries, they're green leaf. They're just a bit of a boring shrub. 
There are now bright pink leaved ones. There are strawberries with bright red flowers that look like miniature roses. So why would you not put that in your bedding display and appreciate it for the beauty of that plant? However, three weeks down the line, I'm harvesting the berries from it. So it's that dual purpose that seems to be very, very popular at the moment and things for containers things that are smaller and things that are easier yes and being yeah. an organic gardener you you don't have to have a large garden it doesn't have to be this great big allotment size garden it could be a couple of plants on a balcony if you're going to think about how they grow how they connect with the nature around you the soil that they're growing in making sure it's peat free making sure you're not using chemicals to kill the insects all that sort of thing you can be an organic gardener in two flower pots, can't you? Exactly, yeah. When I used to build my allotment, you would have gardeners who would, every day of the week, they'd be spraying something or scattering something, and I couldn't even pronounce the word, never mind knew what it did. And I think you wouldn't go and take a teaspoon of that and eat it. You're putting it all over your veg. What is it doing? So what the goal is, you're never going to change that person straight away. However, just by saying to them, do you know what? Put a beer trap down instead of using those metaldehyde pellets, the slug pellets. Just change one thing and then suddenly it becomes routine. Okay, Rob, one final question, and this may stump you. You're off to a desert island. What's Ooh. the packet of seeds you're going to take with you? Oh, blimey. Um, <laughs> what would I say? Do you know what I would say? Onion seed. And why onions? I don't think there is a meal that goes by where you don't use an onion in some form. From a spaghetti bolognese, to a cheese and onion sandwich, to a pizza, to a curry. First soften your onion. How many recipes have you read? Exactly! Rob, we'll give you your onion seeds and do you know we might give you some tomato seeds as well? <laughs> <laughs> Since you're king of tomatoes. Thank you very much Rob, it's been a delight talking to you. Thank you. And now it's time for our popular post bag session. Hannah, I see you've pulled out a couple of queries. I have, yes. So we're going to continue with the weed theme to start off with. So we've had one member ask what he should do with his weeds after he's pulled them out. So Chris, perhaps if you could start. On this one. Well, it will depend on what kind of weeds we're dealing with, Hannah, to start with. So many of the weeds will get germinated, particularly early in the season, will be annual weeds, things like chickweed, this kind of stuff. And they come up and they, the thing about them is you can just pull them out preferably before they start flowering and getting big, and put them straight on the compost heap. Okay. With the more perennial weeds, the more per pernicious weeds, like your buying weeds and the, the real enemies of the garden, I suppose, in a way, um, you can take the, the, the top off them, take the top off them if they're in the wrong place, put them onto the compost heap, but any roots you, you dig up, I tend to incinerate personally. Okay. I don't know if Sarah would agree with that. Oh, that's interesting, Chris. I totally agree with your, your process of getting rid of the foliage first, putting it on the compost heap, you incinerate. I actually drown mine. Do you? I mean, so you make a tea? Right? <laughs> so we, well, we'll point out at this point, we do have nice soft spots for weeds and they do have their place for us. But the ones that are in the wrong place, we then, we just brutally then well, drown feel, or burn. No, but I feel that something like a dandelion or a dock, it's got a very big, very long root. It's yeah. pulling, pulling uh, nutrients out of the soil for its own purposes. So I'm guessing, I may not be right here, but I'm guessing that root is full of nutrients. Yeah. So why not put it in a bucket of water, drown the root so it can no, it's, it's anaerobic in the water, yeah. it can't exist any longer, and then that water may potentially have some traces of those nutrients in it, so, you say, so then you can use it to water your soil. So like make it, they call it a tea, like my allotment site they do this, they have like water barrels and they call it a tea and they'll put a lot of the weed in there and let it soup up and, they, and they, yeah. use it as a liquid I feed. I think you're going to get a natural, it may not be a huge amount of nutrients, but you're definitely going to get something yeah. there, which is going to benefit your soil. The thing is, is don't be putting your perennial weed roots onto your compost Exactly. Because if you take a piece of bind weed 10, 20 centimetres long and you cut it into 20 pieces, Hannah, and you put it on, you'll have 20 plants. So the idea, you need to eradicate it, that part of it, otherwise the problem will come back. Yeah, we have a, an ongoing battle with bindweed at home. So how, you say to drown it, how long would you say it needs to be in that water until Ooh, it's Oh, at it's least dead? a month, preferably two to three months. Okay. I've got an image of Sarah frotting a weed <laughs> under the water. <laughs> <laughs> Which is matched by you torching it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, no weeds were harmed in the making of this podcast. <laughs> Okay, so the next email I've got is an interesting one and I think it'll get a, quite a lively debate. So this member said, I've heard about the no-dig process. Do you think it's a good idea? 
It's a good question, and no dig is certainly very popular, and I think it's popular for a number of reasons, not least it saves you a lot of backbreaking work. Before we discuss it, what no dig involves, let's ask the question, why do we dig in the first place? You dig for two reasons. One is to break up your soil, very often some heavy soils, clay soils or whatever. So it's good to break that up to allow the plant roots to penetrate. So that's one reason for digging. Another reason is to clear a very weed, weed infested patch. So to get the weeds out, we've talked about these weeds with long pernicious roots. Uh, you dig to get, pull those out, to get a suitable soil for your own plants to grow in. So that's what digging does. So what does no dig do to prevent you having to do that backbreaking work? Well, the no dig method involves using a large amount of natural material mulch, and by mulch I mean organic matter, which if added to the soil in a thick enough amount will A, suppress the weeds by stopping the light getting through down to them, but also it will feed the soil and it will encourage the soil life, such as worms, to come up to break down the soil, bring those nutrients down into the soil and it will naturally break it up so it becomes suitable to grow in. Are you with me there, Chris? I will. It's interesting because actually when I... Well, first, I, by the way, I love digging. When people say to me, you can't dig, I get, I, I get a little bit teary because I just love being on a fork and I love being on a spade. And the reason for that is many years ago on the parks, I would double dig in the autumn. So you'd have beds you'd have beds for summer bedding, stay, quite high intense cropping, and you'd double dig. So you'd dig a trench, you'd fill it with compost, and you'd dig another trench and you'd back for a very old-fashioned single or double digging. Um, actually, the reason you can no dig is the worms will actually do that job for you. The and gardener. when you're digging, you have every chance of killing those worms. You do, so you, you, exactly. So the worms, we're now much more aware that the worms will do that work for you. So I'm all for no digging, absolutely, because they, the, 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 the natural process of things will do that for you. There are some issues with it, I'd say. One is, if I got onto my allotment and it was two foot high in cooked grass and horsetail, I'm not going to be able to sow anything or grow anything in that. How do you approach tackling that bit of land? So my answer to that would be, an allotment is a big area, and so I would divide it in half, for starters. One half you're going to put to one side with the no-dig technique. The other half you're left with now just half an allotment, which you can grow on. And if you can only put two or three hours over a weekend into your allotment, which you do when you have a busy life, you can't cover the whole area. Now you've got a smaller area you can get on top of. Yeah. So, back to the area that you've uh, put to one side. There are two ways of dealing with this, but the simplest way is to put down some sort of material which will completely suppress Like a membrane. The that membrane have to be porous, do you think? It's very often people use porous membrane, yes. Non-plastic. But some people use a plastic sheet, some people use carpets. The best thing to use really is cardboard. Okay. And the reason I say that is, first of all, plastic, we're trying to cut plastic out. Mm -hmm. Secondly, plastic may well degrade down into the soil. You don't want that plastic mm -hmm. in your soil. Thirdly, cardboard is pretty easily accessible now. It'll do the job. It will also rot down into the soil and create that nice organic matter, which will help the soil structure. So if you can get lots of cardboard boxes, flatten them, lay them flat on the soil, weigh them down, because otherwise they'll blow away, <laughs> water them even, then you're beginning to do that weed suppressing action. So you're denying light and warm oxygen to them, and so you, that's what's going to snuff them out. That's quite a long process though, isn't it? It is a long process. It can take up to 12 months. Hannah's looking at me with her eyes open. It is. That's 12 it's, months she's got her feet up, mate. She's yeah, it can take up to a year. But what I would add to that is if you can put a layer of homemade compost underneath those cardboard boxes, the worms are going to come up, they're going to love that compost. So you're beginning to feed the soil and you're also beginning to make that soil structure much looser so that when you take the cover off, your soil is in such good condition, it's actually very easy to pull whatever's remaining there, it's very easy to pull it out. Now I've done this myself in a, a relatively small area. It was a raised bed that was about two meters in length and about a meter and a half in width. When I came back to it a year later, most of the cardboard had rotted down, but the stuff that hadn't I pulled off and there was the bindweed roots all sitting up and looking at me <laughs> like a bowl of spaghetti. But like a bowl of cooked spaghetti, it was so easy to pull, to pull them out. To pull out because the sun was crumbling. Exactly. Pop question though, is you need quite a lot of compost to do that if you had an allotment, don't you? So you need so you need bulk. So there are ways around that, aren't there? You can go to local authorities because they have compost at tips. 
you can contact farmers. Obviously, if you're doing manure, you need to make sure it's rotted down quite a lot. So you can access. How would you go about accessing a, a load well, of organic matter? Well, that's a very good question, Chris. And it's the, one of the issues I have with the no-dig advocates is they do talk about large quantities of manure. Well, not many of us, frankly, have access if to If you lived in Palmer's Green, it's not the sort of place you see bags of compost exactly. lying around or manure, yeah. You can still do the same technique by blanking out the light over the weeds just with cardboard yeah. boxes. So you don't necessarily need that um, then. So you can just... Basically, you're suffocating those weeds out and coming back to it 12 months later. Exactly. Using the other portion of your allotment, you can put a couple of raised beds in, you can get growing. Yeah, yeah. exactly, Chris. So you've talked about no dig in terms of weed clearance. What about then after that? Well, I think by then, if you've put enough mulch down or you've put a layer of mulch down, your soil is probably fertile and of good structure. You probably don't need to do any more no dig. Because as we talked about earlier, with weeding, you decide which weeds you want to keep and which ones you want to get rid of. And weeding is an act of organic gardening which involves you with the whole process of observation, of saying, OK, I don't like that weed, I'm going to get it out by hand. So you're on top of your weeding before you've even begun, if you see what I mean. I think one of the things about no-dig that I do find difficult to get my head around is how do you sow into a no-dig bed? Mm. You can plant into it. Sowing, I think, is more difficult. I think you have to prep the soil when you sow. I don't think how you get around it. It's no different from sowing into a tray. You need a crumbly structure that's been consolidated, which means the air pocket's been taken out of it. Which is difficult when you've got a layer of bulky manure on top. No doubt listeners have got their own versions of how they've used no-dig successfully or unsuccessfully, and it would be interesting to hear about it. Certainly I would like to hear, because it's the big buzzword at the moment, or buzzwords, no-dig. Everybody's talking about it. You know, from the from the gardener on the allotment to the gardener on the telly, everyone's talking about it. So it'd be great to get a response and see how people are getting on. And, I mean, I, having learnt a little bit through this process, um, understand you should sow seeds into a very low nutrient growing medium. Do you then, if you've fed your plot with a manure or something very high in nutrients, do you then have a challenge at the seed sowing point? It's a very good question. What do you think, Sarah? I think it's a very good question because we did make the point about when you're sowing seeds in a propagator or a seed tray, Mm. you don't need a rich Mm. mixture. I think before, as Chris explained earlier, before you sow into the soil outdoors, you prepare that soil. Now, you can't have bulky bits of manure and compost on the soil because there's too many air pockets and the seed, therefore, won't, its roots won't have anything to grow down into. So you will have lightly forked that soil before you sow and you will have lightly trod it down, damped it down, whatever you like to call it. Consolidation is the flash word, Sarah. Consolidate, thank you, Chris. <laughs> You will have pressed that soil down so that the seed will get to grip. That means it's not dealing totally with heavily nutrient soil. It's a mixture of loam, which is just another word for garden soil, and compost. So you've made that mix and you've bedded it down. So, you know, uh, at home, we then, preparation for the next growing season, dig in a load of compost. Do you just... Oh yeah, we'll be careful there on that one because you don't want to put a load of compost in at the end of the growing year, round about November, December, because there's every possibility that over the winter rains, that's going all the nutrients are going to be washed away. Yeah. I think once you've used the no-dig technique by adding a thick layer of manure or compost or whatever your bulky nutrient is, you've now got your soil in pretty good nick. You can then follow the ordinary use of compost that we yeah, recommend, you, you, which is a, a of only as and when you need it. You mean, but you can be sparing with it. We've always said as organic gardeners, the compost is your is your gold, so you don't need to put loads of it on. If you're starting out and your soil's quite depleted, then you can use it or you're trying to suppress weeds. After that, I'm quite modest with my my, my application. I agree, And then you also, if you're growing things like runner beans, you can dig them in. That does a job for you anyway. And So it's not something you need to throw about. I would certainly, it's quite an important point, never put compost out in the autumn because it just sits and leaches as... Sarah said, so you want to be applying it in the springtime. But also, you don't need to be not growing in the winter, actually. you just There's lots you can grow in the winter. There's lots of stuff. Salad leaves, chard will grow for the winter, all right. If you sow it, and, and then you can manures. put it down to green manures, to mustards. or So I would, if you're, if you've got the time, in fact, they're very low maintenance, those plants, make sure you've still got stuff growing. I think the concept of digging, of, as Chris was saying, the heavy double dig, where you're getting down into the soil, 
you are so disruptive to the soil life. And it's not just worms, there's a million little microbes and creatures in there that are working to create that ideal growing environment. We may be slightly rambled around this subject. As a method, as a technique, it has a lot going for it, not least because you're adding but it, it's matter to the it's soil. It's interesting now, it is, if I was not a gardener, and it can be a little bit confusing because if you go, well, I've got a really overground pitch. At some point, a fork is going to be involved in, mm-hmm. in the process. So that I always have a little bit of a, I think the word no dig is a bit of a curve because there does need to be some sort of cultivation. And I think also on another level, it's exactly what we say quite often, it's used as a mulch. And a mulch, as we know, is something, that it's usually organic matter. You put it on the soil, it protects the soil, it keeps the moisture in the soil, so it's very useful for when there's a dry period, but it also feeds the soil. So no dig can be, is another word for saying mulch in some ways. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I'm not sure what Hannah made of that discussion, but it's certainly true that if you get any number of organic growers in conversation, there's always plenty more to say about weed management and the no-dig technique. If you want to know more, just go to our website, gardenorganic.org.uk. It's full of tips and advice for all aspects of organic growing. Next month, we hear from two committed organic gardeners who are working in the community, helping people to access fresh vegetables by growing their own. We hope you can join us. Until then, happy organic gardening to all our listeners, wherever you are. Our thanks to Kevin McLeod for providing the music.